Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, okay, so my talk, uh, in my talk, I'm going to provide um, a brief overview of a fraud uh, detection uh, process using uh, data mining, which, which involves um, techniques, maybe at the intersection of uh, artificial intelligence, mach machine learning, and a bit of uh, statistics, and of course, uh, databases or data warehouses. Um, but of course, the main focus of the talk will be on an end-to-end -end, um, process, end-to-end -end process of a data mining project which I undertook. Um, and I'm going to talk about how the data was collected, how the analysis was done, and obviously also the deployment of a model using uh, unsupervised learning and uh, uh, unsupervised learning techniques and some bit of uh, ARIMA time series for the for the prediction modeling. That's the outline. So I'm going to briefly talk or bring about the discussion of fraud itself before talking more on uh, data mining. And then I'm going to also give a description of the problem uh, definition itself, like what triggered this uh, this study. And then I'm going to look at the methodology and um, eventually the findings and discussion, then we'll conclude. Please uh, let me know if, if I'm breaking or if for some reasons, if you can get me. Hello? Yes, okay. we'll do that. I'll call you if you... If okay, you okay, comment. thank you, Doc. Okay, so, um, <coughs> sorry, to start with, banks in Zambia generate 100 million uh, records of transactions on a daily basis. And the biggest challenge being faced in these banks is uh, the inability to detect and prevent fraud uh, due to maybe a shortage of knowledge and actionable insight about the actual patterns which, which are found in those transactions and not forgetting the trend. Which, which, which is happening. Now, just to borrow the definition of fraud, uh, they're saying this is an intentional act or omission uh, designed to deceive others, resulting in the victim suffering a loss and the perpetrator achieving a gain. And uh, in most cases, calculating the actual cost of fraud for many banks is actually a formidable task due to the self nature of uh, fraud itself. And uh, fraud is actually very difficult to prevent and detect because it is an irregular, uh, imperceptibly hidden, and usually time involving, or time involving rather, sorry, which, which usually involves carefully planned crime that can take many forms by, by the perpetrators. Um, in the trends report for the year 2018, uh, the Financial Intelligence uh, Center of Zambia reported unusual transactions valued at about 86 million plus. Uh, these were uh, in the public domain and this report, I remember it was so controversial and uh, a lot of political issues came about. And further in the same report, it was reported that banks in Zambia accounted for about 89.5% of suspicious transactions only. And this is all in the financial sector, of course. Now, um, this picture just gives an overview of a data mining process. Of course, we have uh, someone here with a bunch of data which is mixed, sorry to use that word. <clears throat> and you have to like pass it into some uh, form of um, intermediary uh, uh, storage and then uh, be able to apply some techniques like uh, text mining and data mining for you to be able to derive some uh, knowledge from the same data. Okay. Um, coming to data mining, data mining defined as a process of discovering useful patterns and trends in uh, large data or the, the practice of searching through large amounts of data to find useful patterns or trends can actually be used to solve a range of business uh, problems, which include market basket analysis, customer channel analysis, and of course the important thing, which is fraud discovery, et cetera. And uh, the data mining also no popularly known as the knowledge discovery in databases. This is something I'll talk more about uh, in the next slide. This refers to non-trivial extraction of implicit previously unknown and potentially useful information from the data in, uh, in data Databases. Now, what 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 problem did I identify uh, when undertaking the the study or this project? Um, financial service providers, or simply banks or financial institutions, are involved obviously with generating and handling a huge volume of transactions, as Ada alluded to. 
across their various platforms. So this can be core banking systems, ATM uh, uh, transaction platforms, internet bankings and whatnot, which all form various data sources. Now this data has continued to grow exponentially. <clears throat> And uh, the exponential growth in the transactions has made it difficult to discover fraud because banks do not have better approaches and um, mechanisms to take advantage of this bulky data, which can actually be turned into actionable insights such as identification of patterns which could either be fraudulent or non-fraudulent. And then, um, the, as I mentioned, the fraud is difficult actually to prevent because it's an irregular, impeccably hidden and time evolving, which usually uh, will involve a, a planned crime by someone. And this can take many forms actually. Therefore, despite the serious operational business risks which fraud possesses, many banks are still lagging behind when it comes to having better knowledge, discovery and insights into the types of uh, transactions which are taking place on their systems. And obviously, uh, the, the current methods which are used to detect fraud are static rule based, which means they implement a, a detection logic looking for specific predetermined patterns or set of characters in the, in the transactions. Now, what does this mean? Um, I've had several interactions with a number of uh, auditors. Uh, I, I know quite a number of auditors and I usually observe what they do and i frequently ask them the same question uh you 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 have an auditor come <clears throat> then they'll request maybe for an extract of transactions which involve interest receivables or interest payables on custom accounts and then further they also request for an extract on the general ledger accounts or transactions so that they now do the comparisons now they already know what they are looking for like they've already set uh, the, the, the patterns or set of characters to look for. But what happens to the rest of the data? Like what else should we look for? What else can we get from the other transactions instead of just focusing on interest payables, for example, interest uh, receivables? So that's, that's the biggest problem because so many patterns are not known. Like what else is involved in this bunch of uh, transactions which, which we have? on customer accounts. So the aim of um, the study was uh, to apply data mining over large scale financial transactions in order to discover hidden patterns and the trend, which can then be predicted and uh, give the forecasting. The study was uh, guided by two objectives. The first one was to use uh, data mining for discovering um, significant hidden patterns and trend in large scale financial transactions. And then the second one, most importantly, to, to construct a model, which is obviously a data mining model, to predict and forecast fraud on the basis of the discovered patterns. So once you get the patterns, now you need to get um, the prediction and be able to determine the trend, how things are moving with regards to the same patterns which, which have been discovered. And uh, why was this uh, study very important? Uh, well, um, this will give an improved method to discover hidden patterns and trends in the transactions, thereby giving a wider coverage of uh, knowledge discovery and insight into the types of transactions which are taking place. And the study will therefore enable banks or financial uh, service providers to be able at least to predict fraudulent patterns before they actually happen and then also be able to leverage existing historical data for further better knowledge discovery. <clears throat> now, interestingly, when you hear data mining, or if you are to undertake any data mining uh, project, one thing which you can't do away with is uh, what is called knowledge discovery database, or simply the KDD. This is uh, the entire process itself, but in it, in itself, the data mining is actually a step uh, which, which is very key. And um, just to explain a few steps quickly, the first one, uh, which is just showing data, um, this basically is a first step process which with the goals, that, where the goals are defined from customers, uh, for example, viewpoint, and is used to develop and um, get the understanding about the application domain. And then the second one, which talks about selection, uh, this is simply the second stage, which focuses on creating target data, uh, target data sets, and the subset of that data samples or variables. And then uh, thirdly, there is a transformation. Um, 
Oh, before I move to the transformation, under the same uh, uh, pre-processing, this is where actually most of the data cleansing part takes place. And then when you move to the data transformation, uh, this is where now uh, the transformation of the data from one form to another takes place. This is very important. Um, this is very important because uh, you have to put in together some mechanisms like for data reduction, uh, data dimensionality reduction, and also do some form of coding on the data because most data mining projects will actually involve uh, uh, numerical data. Now, in an event that you have categorical data, it's very important that you do some transformation, which involves some coding techniques. I'll be able to explain in the next slides. And then the next step, which is very important actually, the data mining itself. Uh, this is why you, you involve things like choosing the suitable data mining task. Uh, is it classification? Is it clustering? Is it regression? But again, this depends on the on the nature of the data involved in the in the in the study or the project. And then um, when you choose the suitable data mining task, you move on now to choose the suitable data mining algorithm itself. So, for example, if you choose a classification, you need to look at what types of uh, algorithms will perform under classification. If it's clustering, now you look at things like the k-means, the c-means, and so on and so forth. And then further, you now employ the data mining algorithm on the same stage. And then once that's done, obviously you get some um, some patterns, which will now need to undergo evaluation and interpretation. This simply focuses on um, on the mind patterns to be able to get some 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 knowledge and obviously do some visualization on that as well. Now, um, coming to the collection of the data, first of all, uh, this research was descriptive. What does that mean? Uh, we I was not trying to answer questions about how, when, or why certain characteristics occurred in the transaction, but rather we're trying to address the what question. This, in other words, what are the patterns or characteristics involved? Uh, so the data was collected through data extraction from a core banking system uh, using a PLSQL. This is nothing like um, procedural language and structured query statements. Um, discussing the details of the source system, I think it's not really necessary. Um, the data was secondary, meaning there were no participants involved. This was a direct extraction from the system, so it did not involve things like uh, doing a survey, a questionnaire to, to collect the data. It was just a direct extraction, of course, with uh, permission. Um, this data was highly dimensional and unstructured in nature. Therefore, it did not have any labels. So I'll be able to talk more about this in the next slides. Uh, the experimentation quickly, uh, these were done or carried out in Python language. That was version uh, 3.7 or uh, 64 bit. And then for the IDE, I used PyCharm, the community edition, or for obvious reasons, this did not require a license. And then together with uh, the Jupyter Notebook, which I had to run with the TensorFlow. Now, you may ask, why TensorFlow? First of all, TensorFlow, this is a Python library for fast um, numerical computing created and released by Google, I think. It's an open source artificial intelligence uh, library. Very good when you are talking of uh, data, flow, uh, data flow graphs to build models. So it was quite helpful. Um, remember this diagram I showed you. We talk of now the data pre-processing and transformation, which is very important because here now you have to start massaging the data if you're doing or undertaking a data mining uh, project. Um, as I earlier mentioned, the extracted data was inconsistent, noisy, and highly dimensional, meaning it had a number of uh, relationships among the variables and obviously unstructured. Uh, the preprocessing was therefore done or carried out to make it clean, valid, and consistent. Again, this was all done using Python uh, packages, which are open uh, source or free. Now, under the data preprocessing um, and transformation itself, several tasks had to be under, undertaken or involved, including the cleansing, the transformation itself, the data coding, um, data normalization, 
dimensionality reduction using a technique called principal component analysis. This is something I'll talk about again. And then also the flag variable coding. Now I'll, I'll be able to explain this again. Now, um, were there any issues in the data? Well, you guessed right. Usually uh, the data exported or extracted is noisy and, and unstructured in nature. And in most cases, the level of quality, uh, the level of data quality acceptable for source systems is different. It's actually different from the quality which the data mining model will require. Therefore, so, uh, some of the issues we had to work around were issues to do with missing values or attributes, um, redundant or duplicate records, outliers in the data where we had to use some histograms to identify those and be able to remove them. And then also the data being in a form not suitable for data mining models. So therefore we had to do a lot of cleansing and coding on this as well. Um, this one shows um, some of the packages which, which were used for data pre-processing. Uh, um, if you can see here, it says uh, from scikit-learn or sklearn import pre-processing. This is simply for processing the data, very useful. You can do anything with regards to data processing if this is not imported. And uh, below here, the transformation was used, uh, was, was achieved using uh, a feature called uh, feature scaling. This is also available in, in, um, in, in Python using this standard scalar. Now, um, at the same, same time of uh, pre-processing and transforming data, one component which had to be done was um, normalization or data normalization. Why? Um, after coding, the numerical values were normalized in order to standardize the scale of effect each variable was to have on the results. This was achieved um, by the use of um, a function which also which is also available in Python pre-processing um, dot minimax scalar, and um, now most data mining algorithms require that variables uh, be normally distributed. So usually the the distribution or the normalization scale can maybe uh, fall in the range of 0 0.0 to 1.0. This is actually, if I'm not mistaken, in the standard which I've seen. Uh, with regards to the data normalization I've, I've, I've read about. And then now when you talk of data coding, this, uh, this was done in order to make all categorical features numeric and hide sensitive variables. Uh, so sensitive variables, you're talking of things like um, the actual names of let's say maybe customers and also the original account numbers. These very sensitive, obviously we can't publish this. So we had to code them to some form of funny characters or just numbers. And um, on the same, uh, the flag variable records, this is simply an analytical method used to, um, which required dependable values to be numeric. Uh, therefore, uh, for example, if, if a transaction involves loans and we find that the loan, in the loan transactions, there is a field to indicate if the loan is fully paid off or if it's not paid off, if it's paid off, it will show maybe, for example, a Y or yes. If it's not paid off, it will show N, meaning uh, no. Uh, these are categorical, so you need these needed to be coded uh, into a numerical. So for the Y, we coded this to simply just be a one. And then for a no or N, this was coded to a zero. So, and then the other thing which was done was uh, on the the leg to show if the transaction is a debit entry or a credit entry. This was also done, uh, if, if, if it's a debit, it was coded into a zero. If it's a credit, like a deposit, this was coded into a one. And then um, further, just, just on, on the same coding, uh, with regards to savings accounts, if an account is active, it will usually denote A or show active. So this was coded into a one. For inactive accounts, we use the two, and then um, the dormant accounts, which which has a D, we, we use the three. So whenever we find the value of three, we know that this account is dormant. Now, remember I mentioned that um, the data was um, highly dimensional. 
therefore we had to to do some dimensionality reduction using a technique a very useful technique called the uh, principal component analysis now before applying principal component analysis uh something had to be done this is nothing but the correlation measure you needed to get the correlation measure so that you are able to identify uh, which variables have relationships like they are carrying uh, i can say almost the same information obviously this will affect the performance of a model because it will have some form of redundant variables so if um, if you're able to see these um, blue regions the dark blue regions actually represent high correlation among the variables and uh, dimensions exhibiting higher correlation can actually lower down the performance of a model like i mentioned Moreover, it's not good to, to have multiple variables of similar information or, or variation, also known as multiple linearity, uh, you know, because this will slow down actually the, the performance of the model once you feed it with the data. And then here on this table, we have um, what we call the principal components. So after applying, um, after getting the correlation measure and then PCA had to be applied, which now gave the individual principal a principal components showing the explained uh, uh, variance ratios and uh, the first one usually ha carries um, more information for and then they they move in that order so they advise actually that it's best to take the first two because these are the ones which will carry uh, some good explanation or ex explained variance ratios and then if you add if you had to add these individual ratios you actually arrive at um, a total of 100 which which comes back to the same data before it was uh, uh, before it was uh, broken down into individual components now just more on the principal component analysis uh, there are a number of key things you need to first of all understand or ask yourself uh, before you or if you're about to to, to do some to do some uh, reduction in the dimensions number one um are all variables important? You need to check that. Are all variables numeric? Uh, what if they are having high relationships or some form of variances? How can we identify these variables? And um, when you have to think or talk of the benefits of applying PCA or principal component analysis, um, I would say one, to, to be able to do some data compression, which will obviously reduce storage required and then also to fasten the time required for the performing, um, uh, sorry, time required for performing some computations, so, meaning uh, less dimensions will lead to less computing or computations, which is very good for the model. And then also to, to take care of uh, multiple linearity that improves the model performance. In short, it will remove some redundant features. Okay, um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, the data mining itself involved choosing the suitable data mining task which which was uh, clustering and then uh, choosing the suitable data mining algorithm which was the clustering um uh, chemist clustering sorry and then eventually applying um, applying the the data mining algorithm now you you may ask why clustering task well to start with, this was due to the nature of the data used in the study. Therefore, clustering task was the most suitable data mining um, uh, task or technique to to employ. Um, clustering means simply means grouping of objects of the information on the information found in the data, uh, describing uh, maybe the objects or relationships. The the goal is obviously that objects in one group will be similar to one other and different from objects in the other group, okay? And um, for the analysis, after doing, after, after reducing the dimensions in the data, the analysis was done using uh, what is called scikit-learn. This is a machine learning library, and we, I used the pandas package, which is uh, nothing but for Python data analysis too. All these are open source in uh, Python. And um, to address the first objective, if, if you may remember, it, it stated that uh, we had to apply, be able to apply data mining on large scale financial transactions. Um, and supervised learning technique called clustering, which I just talked about, was used to determine the intrinsic groupings in the, in the unlabeled data 
in order to be able to extract some value in form of obviously knowledge. And then uh, secondly, to address or get findings for the objective two or to satisfy objective number two, the autoregressive integrated moving average. Uh, in other words, the Arima time series was modeled, which took uh, two variables. One, time. Time, this is um, nothing but the period when the transactions were happening. And then the transaction count, which which is nothing like, but um, the number of times an, an individual account was involved in those transactions which took place. Again, um, why K-means clustering? It's a very important question. Why not any other uh, specific um, clustering algorithm or unsupervised learning algorithm? Well, um, K-means clustering was chosen for the following reasons. To determine the groupings, obviously, in the set of the unlabeled data, and then also to be able to organize the data into clusters in order to show some internal structure, and then to achieve some form of partitioning of the unlabeled data. And then the last one, which is very important, um, the scalability of k means algorithm is very good or very well on large n samples as compared to uh, most of the clustering uh, techniques I've come across. Okay. And then obviously the overall purpose of clustering algorithm was to make sense of and extract the value from, um, from large samples of data which, which we had for the transactions. The, the k-means was implemented using this um, uh, feature here or the function sklearn.cluster.k-means. Uh, Again, this is also in uh, Python. Um, just to explain on the model workflow, um, remember where we're coming from, we talked about uh, doing some extractions and now you need to check is uh, the data extracted correctly? If yes, you move to the next step. Um, you need to prepare that data. Is the data prepared? Move on. Is it valid? Have you done some uh, transformation, necessary coding, necessary uh, transformation into uh, necessary transformation from um, categorical into numerical values or variables? If that checks, to be okay, then you proceed to feed in um, the model. Now, one thing which I, I didn't talk about um, is the splitting of the data. Let me just quickly do that. Um, generally, data set is, can be split into maybe 70 to 30 ratio or 80 to 20 uh, ratio, meaning if you take 70 or 80%, this data will be taken into a training and then the 30 or 20 will be data taken in test. However, uh, the splitting can, can vary according to the data set shape and the size. But uh, in this study, uh, the 80 to 20% ratio was, was used. After um, applying um, the algorithm, after everything had been done and then the algorithm um, deployment reached, um, very interestingly, some patterns were observed and just quickly to mention a few. Uh, we, the, we noticed some transactions which were found to be taking place without narrations or remarks, like without information to know the source of the funds or what is the nature of the transaction taking place. And these were common on savings accounts. And um, there were a number of transactions happening on inactive and dormant accounts. Now, from the little knowledge I've gathered in the banking sector, if an account is dormant or inactive, uh, there should be no transactions taking place unless otherwise. I've asked around in so many banks and so many auditors, they've said, if an account is dormant, no transaction should take place. If I should uh, just give an example actually on the same, there was something which happened I think sometime last year, you may have heard about it because it was in public domain anyway, where certain commercial bank um, customers actually had to start complaining or query. They started noticing some funny transactions happening on their accounts and further investigations revealed that actually some dormant accounts were actually used to cipher or move some funds and i hear some people got fired from that bank 
And um, the other interesting thing which was observed was uh, some balance movements on loans, which involved uh, different general ledger uh, transaction and, and transaction geo. Uh, the general ledger and transaction geo usually has to match if you're talking of um, uh, loans. Therefore, if, if any transaction is taking place on a loan, the the GL or transaction GL, which that particular loan reports to, should match the transaction or corresponding uh, uh, general ledger so that the balance is achieved on, on, on those loans. And then again, uh, there were also transactions which were not taken on overdrawn accounts. And obviously, another interesting um, pattern of transactions which was observed was uh, that which involved uh, some loans which were fully paid off or which were showing uh, zero balances. Now, if a loan has a zero balance, it simply means it's either, uh, it, uh, it has either, either been uh, fully paid off by the customer or it has been uh, recovered fully, in other words. And to discuss more on the patterns, figure five shows um, the status or shows the savings accounts actually Remember earlier on I mentioned about the flag variable record or recording where active accounts were coded um, with a one and then inactive accounts with a two and then dormant accounts with a three. So basically this blue region, which shows um, that it corresponds to a one, it means these were active accounts, which, uh, sorry, active, yes, active accounts. So many transactions were taking place on these active accounts, which seems normal obviously and then um, the green one represents uh, a two which is an uh, inactive account so here again there's a big question mark or there's a question mark uh, should these transactions continue happening on accounts which are inactive and then most interestingly the the red region which is um, dormant accounts the model was able to pick patterns of transactions on dormant accounts again this is a big question mark are these transactions uh, allowed to happen on dormant accounts. That again, depends on uh, banking policies. But again, like I mentioned, uh, usually dormant accounts should not have any transactions taking place. And then this other uh, figure, which is number six, shows patterns, on, um, patterns of transactions on loan accounts or involving loan accounts. Um, if the loan is paid off, remember I said, um, it was coded to show a one. If a loan is still running, like the customer is still servicing or repaying, it will show a zero, meaning it's still running. It's considered like a healthy loan. Uh, therefore, again, the model showed that there were some patterns identified or seen to be taking place on loans, which seems to be like having paid off. Again, this is a big question mark. Why are there? Why is there a presence of transactions happening on a loan or loans which have been paid off and just to quickly explore more on the actual entries the table on top uh, shows entries on dormant and active accounts if you see this status here it shows two three two 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 mean the two is inactive three is um, dormant and you can see some amounts which are almost similar and uh, some balances there now um like I'm, I keep emphasizing on the dormant account, if a transaction has to take place, a customer uh, maybe may have to go back to the bank and put it in writing if they have to enable or have the accounts reactivated, and then they'll continue using it. But then again, interestingly, there were some figures which are similar, uh, which, which were picked up in form of patterns to be taking place on these accounts. And then it showed that actually, there were accounts, uh, so it showed that one account had maybe five entries happening in that period with some similar amounts. Now, these look useless and simple for lack of a better term, but again, if you multiply maybe 20 times, uh, for example, 100 dormant accounts or 1,000 dormant accounts, how much money is being moved without knowing? And then moving on to the bottom table, this shows entries of transactions on loans which had been paid off. If you see this account balance shows zero, 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 meaning the loan has been paid off. Uh, the customer, as far as they are concerned, they've either paid it off or, you know, the bank has fully recovered. But then 
why are there patterns of transactions uh, showing on a loan which has been paid off? Again, you may have heard cases or uh, stories where someone will go to maybe bank A, they want to get a loan. Bank A, before they give out a loan, they will check uh, the credit worth of that customer. And then the customer will only be told that, no, actually, you can't get a loan because you're owing bank B. Then the customer will start disputing, I bank B, but I paid off the loan which I had. No, this is a report showing from a credit reference bureau. So all those disputes, it's actually happening. And these are things which, which are happening and going unnoticed, obviously, yeah, because transactions are not being checked. And uh, interestingly, um, moving on to the trend, these patterns, when checked further, um, it was discovered that um, there was a general trend over time from the year when um, the transactions were extracted. By the way, the, the, the period under study for the transaction was just between 2017 and 2019. But again, this, this could have been uh, gotten uh, beyond that. Uh, but this was uh, the, the period I think most of the experiments were, were being done. And then the trend revealed that it was an uptrend, strongly suggesting that the patterns which were discovered were most likely to continue happening or going into the future. Okay, the, this was a gradual movement and uh, the re relatively high values were observed as in terms of number of transactions involved. And um, when you're talking of the prediction, which, which is now under the ARIMA time series, um, the predicted value which was obtained was, um, the score was 0 0.861042 for prediction against the true value or expect, expected value of 0 0.86200. Uh, now, um, when you look at the MSE predictions, this measured the average square difference between the expected values and the actual value of predictions. And the score was actually almost zero uh, signifying the accuracy of the model when it gave the prediction against the expected value. And um, the root mean squared error uh, or RMSC score, uh, this measured the difference between the values uh, predicted by the model. Uh, the mean squared errors described was in squared units of the predictions. This gave a score of 0 0.04. 7 to again in the range of zero, which is almost zero, I can say. Again, signifying that the model had some form of accuracy when giving the scores. And when uh, the prediction uh, plot was done against um, at the original scale, it revealed an interesting trend again. The top line, which is the green, indicates the true or expected value moving alongside the bottom line, which is um, the red one, representing the predicted values. And again, if, if you notice, it's showing to be going upward or an uptrend, meaning the prediction was that this was likely or is continuing going into the future. And um, lastly, when you do the residual plot, uh, first of all, residuals in a time series model are nothing but what is left over after you fit the model. This gave a, a, a plot around uh, zero, which again signified some form of accuracy in the model itself. Okay. And just to discuss that, the, the data mining model successfully gave significant unknown or hidden patterns of transactions and the trend. And um, unlike other approaches, this is something I didn't talk about uh, involving the literature. Um, our model was able to predict and trend uh, and give the trend of transactions on the basis of the uncovered patterns. Now, although detecting fraud is considered a high priority for many banks or financial service providers, the current literature uh, lacks an up-to-date comprehensive and in-depth review that can actually help banks with the decisions on selecting which data mining technique to use or which one is appropriate, okay? And furthermore, uh, the, most, of, most of the, uh, the studies conducted, which were um, reviewed, they focused on fraud in uh, something to do with credit cards, financial statements, or uh, interest receivables, like I had mentioned or gave an example where an auditor will come uh, with 
already set of characters they have to look for in the transaction. And usually this takes uh, place if there is a targeted audit or a random check, meaning something has prompted them to do that. But what happens uh, if, if they are not prompted? Therefore, the model strongly suggests that the patterns and trends discovered are likely to go into the future, which will present more chances of fraud happening. The conclusion, um, fraudulent pattern discovery in large scale financial transaction using data mining is an important task actually, which is grounded on the grouping of um, some objects in the data set, which are quite interesting. And these groups can show significantly different uh, features or characters than the rest of other groups in the same data sets. So by that, you'll be able to now be able to draw some form of value and under understanding from uh, from the, from the data which we are having to to manipulate. And um, just to mention something, this study had some publication. Um, the publication was done in the conference, which was last year, the International Conference in uh, Information Communications Technology. And then the other sections, uh, I'm currently working on a paper, a journal paper to publish in the International Journal of Scientific and uh, Technology Re Research. I think uh, I'll end here so that we have some time for question and answer session or contributions or comments. So Doc, maybe you can uh, facilitate that session now. Right. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, that was wonderful. Now, incidentally, what, the last talk was supposed to be by uh, Christopher Lalusha, who happens to, I think he works for. Okay. He used to work for Absa, I think Absa and Majd or something. Uh -huh. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a good thing that uh, good thing that you gave this talk because he was probably going to give a talk that's tied to the banking sector. Okay. I think he was unable to because he's a busy person anyway. Uh, but. Uh, now i saw john somewhere i wonder how much of what you're doing and i know john john is probably going to ask a question here uh, john was enrolled into csc 5741 last year mm -hmm. he's, he's uh wanting to explore code detection in the telecommunications sector so i wonder how much of what you do is, is going to eventually borrow uh, but before I, I i i invite questions i also wanted to i guess just to point out to the csc 5741 students here number one an apology right now, there are certain things that we will not cover in CSC 5741, sadly, right, because of timing constraints, uh, specific techniques. Uh, like when it comes to clustering, for instance, you, you probably notice that we only maybe look at one or two or something, sadly, because of timing constraints. Um, and then also, uh, I wanted to point out the fact that for the first time in the eight, is it eight talks that we've had so far, for the first time, someone has decided to use a different approach, I don't know if people notice this, a different approach other than the, the so-called crisp DM model that we've sort of like adopted as part of CSC 7 foot one. If you notice, he mentioned he used the KDD process. Mm -hmm. I hope people are taking note of that, important. Uh, and then also, uh, important thing that Knox mentioned, specifically metrics, right? When he was ranting about the root, ma the root mean square error, for instance, we, we're actually discussing those things, specific metrics when you are conducting experimentation in lecture series number seven, which I think I've uploaded. I do apologize that uh, we are, uh, we, he's giving this talk or people have already given talks before we actually get to discuss some of these things. But uh, if people have questions, uh, the floor is open, please. 